Hearing from God is one of the most priceless gifts that was given to us through salvation. It arises from having a relationship with God. God is the kind Father that desires open communication with His children. God wants to talk to you in the morning, at noon, in the evening, every time. He wants to direct you, guide, teach you, and love you. And one way He can direct us is by speaking to us. Dear believer, when the Holy Spirit speaks, know that it is God. When the Holy Spirit is speaking, you should listen to His voice. Child of God, we must listen and obey. So I ask, have you ever thought to yourself, I wish God would speak to us as He did to His people in the Old Testament? God often speaks to His people through a voice, an angel, or a dream, according to Scripture. In one account, He even draws on a wall. It's natural to want to hear God's voice or see a large sign that will reassure you that God is leading you on the right route. We've all been in perplexing situations. You could just wish God would give you a text message telling you what to do. Perhaps you're feeling distant from God and want Him to reach out to reassure you that He's still with you. Perhaps you've heard that the God of the Bible is personal, but you've never engaged with Him and aren't sure where to start. He is the same God we worship now as He was in the Old Testament. He continues to speak to us today. He created the opportunity for every one of us to have a personal relationship with Him, which includes daily communication. He interacts with us. Many of us have either never learned to discern His voice or have forgotten how to do so. So, how does God speak to us in a world full of noise and distraction? God speaks to His people in a clear and audible way. Here are some examples of times in the Bible when He spoke to individuals in a voice they could hear. As a child, He spoke to Samuel in the temple. The story is written in 1 Samuel 3. Out of the burning bush, He spoke to Moses in Exodus 3 and instructed him to rescue his people from Egypt. He spoke to Elijah in a quiet, small voice, not by an earthquake or a strong wind, in 1 Kings 19, 11, and 12. So God can and does speak with an audible voice, even though that isn't the most common way Christians in Western societies hear from God. I have come to assure you today, God can and does communicate audibly today because He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. God also communicates with His people through miraculous happenings like signs, dreams, and visions. In biblical times, signs took many forms, from the Red Sea parting in Exodus 14 to the disciples finding a donkey colt exactly when and where Jesus said they would in Matthew 21. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, dreams and visions are depicted. Revelation, the Bible's final book, describes how John, one of Jesus' closest followers, saw a vision of heaven with gold-paved streets. Dreams and visions communicate in one of two ways, precise instructions or symbolism that the Spirit interprets as a message to people. We usually read about God speaking to people from outside of themselves in the Old Testament, but Jesus has promised something more to those who believe in Him today. Jesus spoke to His closest disciples on the night before His arrest and crucifixion. He was aware that He would shortly return to His Father in heaven. His companions, the disciples, had walked and talked with Jesus every day for several years. In that sense, they never had to struggle to hear His voice. Jesus will soon commission His friends to spread the news of what He had done across the world. However, He would not be present physically with them. They'd need His advice on a daily basis to decide where to go and what to do next. Jesus desired for them to have faith that they would have whatever they required. So He told them God will live inside them in the form of the Holy Spirit in the future. Yes, God would remain separate from them, but He was also putting His actual presence into each person who believed in Jesus. Jesus says in John 16, 12 through 15, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me, 
because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, everything about hearing God's voice changes. If you've decided to start a personal relationship with Jesus, His Spirit has entered your life. Rather than asking where God is or how to communicate with Him, you can rest assured that He is inside you and is always ready to assist you. The Bible is a means via which God communicates with you. God explains how to live the life He has called you to live in it. The Bible is full of stories with lessons, stories in which God speaks truth and reveals what you need to know in order to live a life that pleases Him. God also talks through the Holy Spirit's inward promptings. The Spirit educates you and helps you remember what God has done. John 14, 26 says, But my Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. You are prompted by the Holy Spirit to act in obedience, to turn away from sinful things, and reach out for help from those around you. Internal promptings may compel you to share Jesus' message with those in your life. God desires for you to hear His voice. He has no intention of confusing you. His plan for teaching you to discern His voice is to combine His Spirit with you and His living message, the Bible, in front of you. So. Why do so many Christians live their lives unsure of what God is saying, or even if He is still speaking? Understanding what keeps you from hearing God could be the key. There are a lot of things and people competing for our attention in our life. Many of them are so common that we don't realize how they are interfering with our relationship with God. God talks in a number of ways, and He speaks fluently. However, there are numerous voices always tempting to communicate with us. So, how can you tell if you're hearing God speak? God wants you to have faith in your ability to hear Him. As a result, He provides you with a few options for verifying what you think you hear Him say. For example, through Scripture, you can confirm God's voice and His words. Through the affirmations of others, too, we can confirm when the Lord is speaking to us. Understand this. God's voice is valuable. God wants the best for us, and He tries daily to communicate with His own. There is no way direction, clarity, or knowledge can come from heaven if you do not listen to God. There is just no way. When the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, we ought to listen. When you were a child, your parents gave you instructions by speaking to you, right? It's the same thing with God. And during our childhood, there were consequences of not listening to our parents, right? Child of God, it is the same thing with God. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The Bible makes it abundantly plain that when we make mistakes, God is extremely patient, kind, and gracious. When we do stupid things, however, there are natural repercussions. Sometimes we believe we are intelligent enough to go our own way and do what we want, even if it is opposed to God's will. We keep hoping that everything will work out, despite the fact that we are skating on thin ice. As a result, we occasionally find ourselves being battered by the inescapable storm. It's a self-made shambles, one that frequently exceeds our expectations in terms of cost. In Acts 27:21. The Bible says, After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. Most of us have tunnel vision for what we want and are adamant about achieving it. However, as stated in Acts 27, we could save ourselves a lot of trouble if we just listened to God before venturing into perilous waters. Let improving your ability to listen and obey the Holy Spirit be a part of your goals. Here are three things that can happen if you don't listen. 1. You're going to miss God. Jesus cautioned us to be attentive in our listening. Luke 8:18 8, says, Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, 
Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. God has a plan, a purpose, and a goal for your life. It's more than just going to church on Sundays for an hour. You shouldn't ask God, what do you want me to do, all the time. Can you tell me where you want me to go? Can you tell me who you want me to speak with? God has already communicated with you through His Word. All you have to do now is read and obey it. If He summons you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This was how Eli instructed young Samuel in 1 Samuel 3.9. Samuel was always missing God's words, and it required Eli to educate him on how to pay attention. 2. You'll experience the same difficulties over and over again. If you're on your third marriage, your fourth job in two years, and your buddies are always changing, you have to wonder, could the problem be me? Those that are closest to you have the most accurate information about you. The reason you're having the same problem over and over is that you're not listening. You're the problem. We excuse ourselves by blaming and assaulting others. Listening's goal is to hear the truth and develop. 3. You will become disoriented. Not only will you become spiritually lost if you do not listen to God, but you will also get spiritually lost if you waste hours every day watching TV, Facebook, drinking, and playing phone games. You go to work, then you come home and numb. There are no objectives, plans, or direction. You're just waiting to go back to work. God is speaking. He wants to give you knowledge in order for you to lead your family, your job, your church, and your life in general. The issue we must ask ourselves is not whether or not God is speaking, but whether or not we are listening. Child of God, again I tell you, when the Holy Spirit speaks, we must listen. Man, by nature, is a product of influence. Have you ever heard the saying before? Some people believe that wrong company cannot influence them. They claim that they know themselves and are strong enough to stay connected without being corrupted or influenced by anyone. Do you think this is true? The Bible gives us an outline of God's supreme counsel over this issue, one that we must give attention. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You are greatly in the wrong if you believe that you can do with everyone in your life. Not everyone in your life should be there. The story of Abraham and his nephew Lot is a great example for us to learn. At some point, Abraham had come to realize that if they both continued together, there would be a crisis between them. And being a man who knew how that can reflect his relationship with God, himself and those around him, he sought for a separation from Lot. It is not as if they became enemies, but they just weren't walking in that close fellowship anymore. Why? Because relationship is influenced, dear saint. Please do not miss it here. This is something many believers fail at. Our relationships are meant to be a blessing to us and make us better people. However, if and when you surround yourself with the wrong people, even your good nature and morals are bound to be affected directly or indirectly. Not only that, but the people in your life can also have an impact on your faith, development, and state of mind. Remember that the Bible is the highest authority for the believer, and it will do you good to give attention to it. Hence, it is a valid point to say that your life, good or bad, will be the product of those you keep around your life. Do the people you call your friends speak anything good to you or about you? Do you meet with them and feel worse about yourself than good? In the bid to have fun and adventure, is your safety put at risk? Does your relationship lead you into more trouble and make you lose your integrity and trust? Would you call such relationship a healthy one, one that helps you draw closer to God more and more? Would you consider yourself blessed with such an association? Beloved, one of the worst things you can do for yourself is to surround yourself with anyone who that does not push you into God, into your best, into truth, and into safety. I've seen people who 
can't talk about Jesus with their friends because they always shut them up. What is the whole essence of beautiful relationships in our lives? Why is God so keen about your association? Is friendship only about having someone fill the spot in your life? Is there something more to it other than keeping you from loneliness? Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. This is not only talking about bosom friends, but generally those you are connected with. Acquaintances, partners, colleagues, bosses, and even family too. A time comes when God would have you walk away from some people because of the plans that He has for you. If or when you fail to walk away from them, you will place yourself in unhealthy situations orchestrated by the devil through them. For instance, do you know that some temptations are in your life right now because you are in a certain place not by your own will, but because someone placed you there? This can be a physical location or even a psychological one. God never desires those He loves to be full of negativity. Negativity is a tool of the devil, and most times He will use humans to inject that into you, thereby bringing you into the shackles of depression and similar bondage. It is not the will of the enemy for you to be okay, to achieve God's best for you, to have all God wants you to have, and to be who God wants you to be. In fact, for everything God wants to accomplish in your life, Satan also has his own agenda, a corrupted version for you. For example, God wants you healed, and Satan wants you sick. God wants you well and in peace, but Satan wants you depressed and frustrated. God wants you provided for, but Satan wants you in lack and worry and sorrow. I believe that you are aware of the alarming rate of suicides and violence occurring all over the world today, especially among young people with their lives still ahead of them, some even among Christians too. These, among other things, is the agenda of the devil manifesting himself. And by careful observation, more often than not, individual crises arise not from the individuals themselves, but many times from the people around them. Sometimes you might not even be aware of this, but you are where you are today because of your people in your life. If God would open your eyes to see into the Spirit, you would truly know that not everyone who is with you is truly with and for you. Dear saints, there are the types of people you must walk away from. You must avoid them in your life. Number one. Those who steadily speak negative things into your life don't see anything good in you and never appreciate your uniqueness. In a world surrounded with depression, fear, and low self-esteem, many troubles have come into the lives of many promising individuals simply because they are looking for validation and encouragement. And how did they come to this point where they think they have to do this or that in order to prove that they are competent and good enough? Someone has fed their hearts with that notion. They've never been accepted or appreciated. They've never been loved. All the time, they have only known themselves to try to give love, give help, meet someone else's expectations of them. They have never truly known what it means to be in a love-filled atmosphere, a space to both give and receive love and affection, a place to give and receive praise. I don't know if this resonates with you or with where you are right now, but please be reminded, you are a child of the light, and there is no negativity in the light, anything short of this darkness, and you must not have fellowship with darkness. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Light and darkness have nothing in common. So you must be very conscious about setting a guard over your heart, dear saint. The Bible tells us that we should give no place to the devil. Allowing people, however, to speak evil or inject evil motives in your heart is one of the ways we can give place to the devil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Stay away from every kind of evil. Number two. You must also walk away from people who construct evil in their hearts and invite you to join them. God has shown us from His words the things He hates. Although He loves us, He also warns us to stay away from them. 
and from people who persuade us to do them. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 says, My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. Walk away from them. God does not want you among them, dear saint. There was a high school kid named Matt. Every time he went to school, he would meet up with some friends who'd compel him to compromise his morals and his faith. Matt, however, never tried to avoid them. He did not listen even when his parents warned him to stay away from them, citing the consequences of hanging out with such company. Soon, their influence over Matt became stronger and more visible to everyone. He was no longer the beautiful kid everyone had known him to be. Matt left high school knee-deep in drugs. Even when his parents tried to help him, he would yell at them with so much contempt and with words lacking piety. Matt would go on his way until he was arrested and jailed for a long time over numerous charges. No one could help this time, and he had to face the consequences alone. Some of his friends died, and some had even turned a new leaf. Others were nowhere to be found, and he was alone. Matt remembered that everything he was warned against was actually playing out in front of him. Not only so, he knew. The signs were there. He just didn't take them into account. Now he was paying for it. Matt would later repent, turn to the right path again, and be released on parole. But he would have wasted a great part of his life. He would have to start many things over again. Thank God for healing, forgiveness, and restoration. However, it is better for you to avoid some troubles than to simply be restored from them. Your greatest deliverance is not that you entered and came out, but you escaped it as a whole. Like Matt, I would like you to know that you can ask God to show you the signs and the individuals you need to walk away from in order for you to be the person He has ordained for you to be. These signs could be immorality, crime, malice, unforgiveness, negative habits, and other vices. Doesn't matter what they say or how successful they are at it, you must not be a part of that association. Your life is precious to God. Don't waste your life in an association that will destroy your destiny. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19-20 through 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It then becomes our responsibility to follow God's leading and walk away from them. We must walk away from them without looking back because they are very toxic to our lives and our relationship with God. Others on this list of people you must walk away from are those who get mad when you forgive or help other people, those who mock you when you talk about the faith or anything pertaining to the kingdom of God, those who claim to be believers but twist the word of God to suit their ungodly lifestyles those who threaten you or avoid you when you stand up for the faith, anyone who encourages you to break God's word or stay away from fellowship with other believers. They will make you walk against the will of God for your life. They can make you stop praying regularly. They can cause you to stumble in your faith walk. These associations can even make you arrogant, disloyal, and rebellious. Many people have left the faith because of some persons in their lives. Joseph almost died because he did not understand the hearts of his brothers were against him, and he was sharing his deepest secrets and visions with them. Don't underestimate the power of influence anyone in your life can have over you. So, as someone with a life of purpose, called to declare the wonderful works of God, as one who wants to be a blessing to others, you must beware of the kind of people you allow into your life. Know when it is time to stay and when it is time to walk away. If you keep your eyes on God and you let Him point them out for you, you will find out that He is always keeping you from falling into the wrong hands. When God opens your eyes to see them, you must not hesitate in walking away from them. As you grow in intimacy with God, you must seek instead to surround yourself with God's people, those who genuinely love and serve God. These ones will happily join you and encourage you in prayer and the study of the Word. They will encourage you to walk in love and kindness. These ones will never encourage you to engage in unrighteousness, but will spur you up towards righteousness. In order to create a roaring fire, one piece of firewood cannot generate enough heat to cook a meal on its own. 
it needs other firewood as itself. Similarly, for you to burn for God, you need to reconnect with those who are true believers. Don't be deceived by the outward show of good. Anyone can claim to be genuine. However, God sees and knows the hearts of every person. Therefore, yield more to the Lord. Ask Him to reveal each one to you. He will do so, and once you see the signs, walk away. You must remember that since our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and power, we don't just shut people out completely. Instead, we are always on guard while we pray for the light of God to touch them. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes to know those whom you must avoid and help you to connect with those He sends your way. Amen. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Bible says one proof that we're children of God is our ability to be led by His Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of God's greatest gifts to every Christian, and He lives in your heart if you've received Jesus in there through faith. Although some Christians are still being taught that the Holy Spirit does not live in people like He used to, or that He doesn't work in anyone anymore like He did in the days of the apostles, as humble as this may sound, it's not a message from God. And that's not the only problem. When we are unaware of the blessing and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are shut out of countless possibilities meant to be ours in Him. For example, the Bible says He's God's seal upon everyone who believes, placed there as proof of God's ownership, a down payment for our salvation, and the assurance of our heavenly inheritance. Ephesians 1, 13-14 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. Dear Saint, I don't know whom you've been listening to or where you read it from, but listen. You have the gift of eternity in your heart, the Spirit of the Almighty indwelling you. God has not planted you here and left you to do life by yourself. In fact, He said He does not call anyone to seek Him in vain. Isaiah 45, 19 I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, Seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. One of the beauties of God is the constant fellowship of His Spirit with you. And Paul prayed that the grace of our Lord Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of His Spirit rest and abide with you, both now and forever. Why? Because He's here for you, to help you, to guide you, to comfort you, until you become all that God wants you to be. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you today, dear saint. There are many voices out there, but you have to listen to the one that matters. You've listened to other voices for far too long. Now it's time to listen to the one that truly matters. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will speak His words to you. He would take from Christ and pass it to you. John 16, 13 to 15. But when He, the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify Me, because it is from Me that He will receive what He will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is Mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from Me what He will make known to you. His work is fulfilled when you walk in the path of Christ. Child of God, I know the road's been rough. I know the future doesn't show much promise ahead. I know that sometimes you struggle with thoughts of quitting. I know that sometimes you struggle with the many questions that plague your mind about your faith. Hear me. The Helper is already here, and He wants to encourage you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to revive you with the ability you need to finish the race. And not only to finish, but to also conquer your oppositions on the way to the finish line. 
What's the outcome of listening to other voices but the one that truly matters? You will struggle with identity crisis. You will never seem to be enough. You will never be good enough, tall enough, handsome enough, educated enough, rich enough. Where the world is concerned, nothing is ever enough. To listen to the voices coming out from the world is to subject yourself to a life of grief. This is the source of many frustrations and depression that drive many people to take their own life or the lives of others. Deep down, they seek validation, acceptance, hope, and strength. Very few are hanging on to the one voice that counts, the voice of hope. I bring you this message today. It's the message of the Holy Spirit, the message that matters. It's the message of encouragement. Maybe you looked at yourself in the mirror lately and all you can see is a failure who does nothing but fail. Maybe you looked and you saw the face of a person who, though you say you love God, you've done nothing but disappoint him day in and day out. You feel you're too weak to be counted worthy too dirty to be called holy, and too weak to even stand among the elect of God. This is the voice of your mind, of the devil, and of your circumstances. Now listen to the voice of God through his spirit to you. Jeremiah 1, 5 to 8. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Like Jeremiah the prophet, maybe you're echoing the voice of the world that you're this or that. Now God wants you to look up and hear what he's saying about you. One of the biggest challenges of many people on the earth today, especially among young people, even Christians, is identity crisis. There's who the world says you are. There's who God says you are. And whomever you listen to determines the identity you take up. So when you see people live chaotic and empty lives, even when they pretend everything's okay, they've sided with a false identity bestowed upon them by the world. But those who resist and choose to listen to what God has to say and take up the identity He bestows, they are the ones who are able to experience the glory of His presence. God told Jeremiah not to fear what the people would do to him because he was a youth. Why? Because he would be with them. Oh, what a great reminder of the promise of Christ before leaving the earth. Behold, I am with you to the end of time. What a promise. It was relevant then and still relevant to us even today. My friend, it's time to take your eyes off what everyone's saying and focus your attention on the power that God has given you through His Spirit. It's time to take your eyes off what your circumstances are saying and focus it on what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. There is no limit and no telling the extent of the operation of the Holy Spirit in anyone who lets Him have His way. He can turn the weak into strong he can make the blind see. He can set captives free. He can be a light in the dark. And he can restore hope to the hopeless. That is who he is. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Take note, according to his power, not your power, but his power at work within you. How is God's power at work within you? His Holy Spirit. That's it, my friend. So instead of thinking about where the power will come from or how weak you are, it's time to listen and cooperate with the untapped reservoir of divine power coursing through your spirit right now. It's time to trust in the power of the spirit inside you. And I don't mean our own spirit or the spirit of the world. No, I mean the spirit of God himself the Holy Spirit, the one you and I received the day we came to Jesus. Romans 8, 14 to 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Jesus calls him the Spirit of truth that the Father sends. That's the one. There's no lie in him, no falsehood, no flattery. He's the truth in the day and in the night. And when you know his truth, you will be set free. Let these words begin to unlock every chain in your life right now. The chains of desolation and depression. The chains that have succeeded in making you feel like you're all by yourself, broke and good for nothing. Break out from it today. You matter to God. Therefore, he gives you the right to be his child. You matter to Jesus. And that's why he's not ashamed to call you his brother and sister. You mattered when he left heaven to come here to die for you. You mattered when he walked the streets of Jerusalem under the sun. You mattered when he was being tortured. You mattered when he hung on that cross. You mattered the day he resurrected and ascended to the Father. And you still matter now that he sits on the throne in heaven. These are not my words, but the words that the Holy Ghost wants you to hear. He beckons on you to turn back to him. There's a place of comfort and healing in him. You've neglected it for far too long in your pursuit for the same thing in the world. Now, the Holy Ghost wants you to come to the place of trust with him, the place of hope in him, the place of guidance in him. So when you're discouraged, trust in his power to inspire you. When you're lost and confused, trust him to direct you again. When you feel lonely, trust him to comfort you. When you're wounded, trust him to heal you. Believe me when I say that you need the Holy Spirit more than you can imagine, and you cannot do without him. It's time to listen to what he's saying to you through his message. With the Holy Spirit, be sure to know that you have never and will never be stranded. The key word is trust. It connotates a complete dependence, like you rest your head on a pillow while you sleep. The Lord wants you to rest your weary head upon his chest and find peace there and echo these words from his heart. Behold, I am with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. You've tried your way. Now give me the chance to fix things up my way. Receive the sweet relief that comes from allowing the Lord to have his way with you. Amen. The disease of worry and anxiety is a cruel killer in our world today. So many are plagued on all sides with abundant reasons to faint and lose heart. So many are pressed strongly on all sides that they begin to lose hope that they could survive this or overcome it at all. People are so besieged by fear of the future, near future, and the unknown that it poisons and ultimately suffocates their today. Living in the now sounds like a far-fetched tale of foolish rambling from people who are careless and irresponsible about their lives and the attending situations of the life they find themselves in. This acidic and toxic fear completely kills whatever hope many have for tomorrow, forgets many in the past, and roots till it buries even more in the decision of today, effectively terminating their hope, hence their lives. And so you find very young and vibrant men and women who are completely buried by the realities they find themselves in. So worried that they begin to age extremely quickly. They age so quickly because of worry of problems and situations in life. This is a sad reality in our world today. Is this your tale also? Are you well seated in a journey to a short-lived existence because of anxiety, fear, doubt, and hopelessness, then this is God's very deliverance for you. God wants to save you from the harsh conditions of hopelessness and fretting. God wants to bring you, yes, even you, out of the pit of struggling alone and scheming your way to the future you hope to get to. God wants to permanently place you far above the confirms of this struggle. God wants to be your rock 
and hope and stand by. Matthew 6, 25 through 28, King James Version. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Jesus, the Son of God, walked this earth and had to live and face the diverse issues of life same as every one of us. He too had a need to eat. He too had the need for clothing, to care for his parents and beloved disciples. The Bible recorded that at one point in time, he was so sad that he cried, heartbroken by the death of his dear friend Lazarus. He was every bit as human as any single one of us. He felt betrayed and was pushed to his death by one of his most trusted ones. Under the heavy hand of agony and pain, he prayed in the garden till the very sweat from his body was as thick as blood. Jesus knew pain like every one of us. He knew firsthand what disappointment tasted like. He was bruised and hurt for crimes he knew nothing of. In the end, he was dragged, insulted, stoned, and crucified by the very ones he has poured out his heart in healing, delivering, and teaching for the better of his ministry here on earth. So when this same person says not to worry, it is worth listening to. He said very clearly in his word to you and to me not to fall into the popular trend of worry and fretting. And yes, it is popular. So many people go around life carrying the whole burden of the world on themselves, going about life with a very heavy attitude, constantly pushing their health and well-being to the limit by trying to solve all the problems of the world. God does not want that for you. He has something so much better than concern and stress for you. He has made a roadmap that brings so much peace and joy ultimately for all who will but believe and give themselves wholly to this way and trust in Him absolutely. And like every other blessing of God, it is of the highest that you believe in God. Having faith that what He said He will do is exactly what He will do that faith then provokes you to do your part in trust that God cannot lie and is faithful to bring to pass all that He has said concerning you and your loved ones. What then is the requirement? Hands of worry and concern luggage. In the world today, many people cannot even begin to conceive the idea that they are expected to live as though it does not matter, to live without a worry in the world to absolutely go about life as though someone else had it all worked out for them. To many in the modern world, it is just a display of outright negligence and irresponsibility to behave in this manner. That's where the tricky stuff is, dear Son of God. It is in the details. God did not ask you to wake up and go about life carelessly and recklessly as though life does not matter. He is definitely not asking you to whistle your way in life in supreme reckless abandon with no connection to anything whatsoever. No, God is not saying to not sit and plan your ways and agenda. He is not telling you to abandon the ship of your life and sleep and lazy off on the deck in complete irresponsibility. No. Now God is not also saying that you should go about with a weight on your life permanently with you, trying to figure out everything trying to plan for all possibilities to better equip your fail-proof plan. He is definitely not asking you to hold desperately unto the wheel of your life and lose sight of Him and everything else because you want to make meaning through the success of your life. No. He is asking you to believe the truth in Him. He is asking you to hang all your hope and faith on Him alone, having made your adequate preparations. He is saying that He wants to help you take care of the ship, both on deck and from the seas. He wants to bring the wind to your sails, 
He wants to calm the waves to give you a hitch-free ride. He wants to deal with the sea turbulence for you when you have no way of helping yourself. He wants you to trust and hope in Him alone and not trust in the arm of flesh. Psalm 18, 1 through 3, King James Version. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. God wants your trust in Him and Him alone. Now quite a number of people out there go around mouthing off how they love God and trust Him and believe in Him. Sadly, this is not true. The truth will always be reflected in what you do. If you really trust in God, you will do what the Word of God says, dear one. God was very clear in His Word and is not about to change His mind on the subject. He does not do as men normally behave. He does not have a review season of His almighty policies and word. He does not go about changing what He has said for anyone because of the times and seasons that have become peculiar. No, God's word is sure on the subject. He made it painfully clear through the first scripture that we read. Worry about absolutely nothing. Do not fret and be fearful. God is telling you to calm down in the ship. He has the storm covered. He had the waves under leash. The winds may blow from now till next week, but so what? God has them in his able pocket and is not about to lose control of them. God does not sleep. He is permanently seated on the throne in heaven, administering all things. Now he is awake every day, all day of your life to give you a permanent and unyielding advantage. He is awake so you can sleep. When the others are busy getting heightened blood pressure over the issue, calm all the way down in absolute faith in God. He has got your back. Other people might not be able to boast of anyone who is so committed to the full success of their lives and destinies and go all out to help them stand out from the crowd of hustlers and the struggling mass. But you can. You have the Almighty God on your side. He has said, Hey, I got this. Take the load off and come to me. I will help you carry that load. Mine is lighter. Take mine and carry it instead. God, in all His wisdom, created the whole earth and all that is in it. The birds, fishes, and all. The birds have no storage facility somewhere in the sky where they can administer managerial skills and skillfully plan their survival on their struggles and plots through their life? No. God is so faithful to the detail that even the most seemingly worthless bird is well planned for in his grand strategy of things. He watches over them faithfully and is fully aware of their dealings. The same is true for every other creature out there. The diversity of the myriad of millions of discovered species of animals out there and even the tremendous number of undiscovered ones all depend on the Lord for their sustenance and existence. All these years, He has always remained faithful and kept them. You, dear Son of God, very child, you are so much more precious to Him than the millions upon millions of animal species out there. Your worth to Him can truly not be calculated at all. He desires to have you truly hope completely in Him. He never forgot you and never will forget you. He has your best interest at heart. He is vividly in control over the affairs and swells of life. His plan is to have you surf through it all as you lay in His able arms, no matter the storm and season of life you are in or will ever encounter. Jesus wants you to know that He, the Almighty God, is on your ship with you as you sail through life. He is there with you right now. Yes, even now. He is watching over your care more than a father, a mother, can ever do, more faithfully than a lover can ever do also. Jesus has the best plans for you. The only requirement? 
trust absolutely in only the Lord God and depart once and for all from worrying and fretting. Fire in the life of a Christian is a major component. It is what drives everything that you are. It is what sustains everything that you do, and it sets you apart from the world and everyone else. You know, there is a world of difference when you've been walking in cold for a long time, and then you step into a room that has a fireplace going. You feel that difference because it affects you. It affects what you're going through. It doesn't take away the cold wind outside. It doesn't change the fact that there's so much cold outside. However, it affects the cold that's happening to you. It affects your body. It changes the effect of the cold you had experienced outside. In Matthew 5, 14 through 16, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It is very important for you to note that when Jesus called his disciples light, he wasn't talking about just who they were as flesh and blood. Instead, he was talking about who they were as a result of something on the inside of them. What made them a light? What because they had light inside of them? It is safe to say that they were who they were because of what was in them, fire. Dear friend, the fire in you as a child of God is the burning love of God in our heart. The fire in you is the continuous activity of the Holy Spirit within you. The fire represents the burning passion to see God's will done on earth and his pleasure satisfied regardless of the cost. So when you just can't contain yourself, if you don't open your Bible in a day, not because of any religious duty or eye service, but because you believe that you need it to survive and you love the Lord, it is fire burning in your heart. When you just can't do without praying, when you would rather spend time with the Lord in intimate fellowship then with everyone else for no productive reason, there is fire in your heart. What do you feel when you see a soul on their way to hell? When an individual blasphemes against God, opposes your message and mocks you? When they choose instead to live for themselves, deliberately watering down the consequences of their choices in eternity? What do you feel towards them? It is the fire inside your heart that will drive you to share your faith with them. It is the fire that will drive you to intercede for them. This fire can't allow you to walk in unforgiveness. It can't allow you to steal, to cheat, to enjoy sin, and to laxity towards the things of God. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 20, verse nine. But if I say I will not mention his word, or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Even Paul wrote about it as the love of God that compels. What a powerful word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Saints, without the fire of God, your Christian journey would be like traveling with a destination in mind, but no motivation and hardly sufficient fuel to take you there. Do you want to go there? Yes. Do you want to be there? Yes. But without fire, you will find yourself without motivation to go the way you used to, in need of help and in need of direction and strength again. This, dear believer, is the burden when your fire goes out. Although God has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you, please do not take the dying or complete loss of your fire lightly in any way. It is that serious. 
Consider this for a second. What happens when you leave a cooking stove without heat or fire for a very long time? I don't know about you, but I've seen spiders and cockroaches build colonies around and inside cold stoves before. However, when the stove is lighted and the fire restored, they will either get burned or they scamper away. What happens when a home is left uninhabited for too long? Rodents, thieves, weeds, and many other uninvited things take over it. However, if it is occupied, none of these happen. My dear friend, one of Satan's agenda for you is for your fire to go out. He knows that when your fire goes out, your life becomes easier for him and his demons to infest. If you're listening to me right now, and your fire is either going or has already gone out, it is my prayer that this message brings you hope and helps you connect back and reignite the fire once more. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul said, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It takes being on fire for God for you to stand firm, my friend. When your fire is going out, one of the signs is that you are no longer as stable as you used to be. You are neither here nor there. Things you were once convinced about, you begin to question. Things you once believed, you begin to doubt them. When your fire is going out, like I said earlier, motivation begins to die. You would rather be by yourself than reach out to God. You who would put it upon yourself to pray, to read the Bible, to talk about Jesus with others, to stand for the truth, now feel like you're a different person. Now someone has to come talk you into it. Now you can't even recognize your passion anymore because somehow, like a smoldering flax, everything that once stirred you no longer does. But thank God for his promise to us. This is our hope that even though it is not what we should desire to experience and not what God wants for us, we experience this. It's not the end of the journey yet. Isaiah chapter 41, 9 through 10. I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You need to understand this and believe it as you rise up to take back your fire. If you don't, Satan will come quickly, take advantage of it, and may make it more difficult for you to be restored. God promises us that so long as we are his children, he will be with us. It is true that the degree of God's presence or activity in our lives will greatly vary, depending on how much of his fire is burning in us. Yet it's worthy of note that God will not abandon you because your fire has gone out. If he says he will never leave you, he means every word of it. For example, when David committed adultery, he knew something happened to him on the inside. That was why he penned down the heartfelt prayer of Psalm 51. You already know that David's story didn't end because of the murder he committed or the adultery. He was restored and he burned for God till his last breath. What should you do when your fire goes out, dear child of God? Here are five things that will help you reignite the fire of God in your heart again. One. Genuinely acknowledge that your fire has gone out and you are in need of fresh fire. One of the biggest lies you'll ever tell yourself is pretend that your fire is still burning when you know it's gone out. You see, God cannot help you if you do not acknowledge your need for his help. The thing about the fire of God is that you cannot fake it. You can deceive everyone else into thinking you still have it for a while. 
but not forever. You can't trick God, and you can't deceive yourself either. You might try for a while, but in time, it will wear you out. Your strength will fail you eventually. Why? Because the fire is not the product of man's strength, but of divine life active within man. So when your fire goes out, God wants you to come again. Acknowledge that you need the fire again. Call to Him. Don't run away from God because you're cold. Would it be safer to run away from home into the cold night or to run home where you would get warm even if you have a fallout with your parents? God loves you regardless. Remember He sent His Son to die for you even while you were a sinner. Would He now throw you away? Not because you are still a sinner, but because you grew cold? Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Dear friend, call to the Lord today in honesty and confess your need for His fire in your life again. He is more than willing to answer and restore you. 2. Rebuild your prayer altar. Prayer has proven to be a believer's place for generating power. Therefore, when the enemy wants to pull you down, he makes you prayerless. Hence, if prayerlessness is associated with powerlessness, then being powerful is a surefire way to ignite your inner fire. No wonder Jude 20 says that we build our faith, recharge our inner man by praying in the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to go back to your prayer altar. Start spending time again in prayers with God. There is only so much you can do by your own strength. You need God's strength and that is found in prayer. Three, feed on the word. Reading and spending time with the Word of God, the Bible, can never be overemphasized. The believer himself or herself is the fruit of the Word of God. Therefore, he or she will only survive by feeding on the Word. Sometimes the cause of our fire going out is because of spiritual starvation or malnutrition. Some of us feed off the wrong things instead of on God's Word. Therefore, our inner man suffers for it, and our fire goes out. However, the pathway to your fire is not complete without the Word of God. Jeremiah wrote about the fire again in Jeremiah 23, verse 29. He wrote, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? So to get your fire going again, you need to get back into the Word of God. Let me quickly say that planning and implementing a personal fellowship routine of prayer and studying the Word of God or reading a book, listening to a word-based teacher or preacher is also a very powerful aid to reviving your spiritual fire. 4. Separate yourself from extinguishers. Many times some of us don't know that the reason our fire is going out is not only because of the absence or starvation of some things, but the presence of some others. The presence of one thing can lead to the absence of another. For example, the presence of a leak in an air balloon will lead to the loss of air from that balloon. The presence of an enclosed space around a fire will result in the absence of oxygen, without which the fire will die. Look at you. Maybe the reason your fire is going out is because of the things or people you've attached yourself to. In order for your fire to burn again, my friend, I encourage you to separate yourself from them. Let them go. Do not attach yourself to the things that God wants you to take your hands off of. They will limit you in your walk with God. Anything that wants to take the place of God is a fire extinguisher. Stay away from it. Whatever would rather encourage you not to seek or take God's business as serious and as sacred as you should is a fire extinguisher. It is only a matter of time before they'll move you away
from the source of the heat. God is very interested in those around you. It's either they are sharpening you or making you blunt. It's either they are adding more flames or sucking you dry. Five, share your faith frequently. Lastly, the more you share your faith, the more you will grow in it. The more you talk about the Word of God with others, the more of its fire you will build inside of you. Silence, self-isolation, fear, timidity, discouragement, none of these will ever help you burn for God. When you should be in the company of other believers from whom you can draw inspiration, heat and encouragement, the devil gives you a thousand reasons why you should stay away. This is a strategy to keep you cold until all your fire and eventually your faith is gone. But the devil is a liar. You are a child of God, my friend, and this is not the end. Rise up today and take God's outstretched hand. Come take your place among his children once again. Talk to him in all honesty, pray, constantly feed on the word of God and dedicate yourself to living for God like you're supposed to. You may have to fast for a while. Do that to shed the weights in your spirit and open yourself to God. You will see him revive you again. And when God revives you, you will become the light that the world is meant to see you be.